Shut up and sit down. Welcome to the Roofer Report, brought to you by Roofer.com. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Roofer Report. I'm your host, uh, Pete McKendrick, and excited to be here back with you guys on another great topic around the Roofer Report. Uh, we've been transitioning over the last couple of weeks with the topics and really focusing on the tactics you could use and qualities that you can have to better run your business, moving away from the tech topic a little bit. And it's been a joy to talk about that stuff and see what we can do to help you guys out. And really looking forward to today's conversation with our guest, Ty Backer from TC Backer. I'm sure you guys know him from behind the tool belt, his live show that goes live, what, weekly, right, Ty, on Facebook? Yeah. And uh, if you guys haven't seen that, check that out. He's always got great guests on there and cover some fantastic topics. But you know, I'll give Ty just a quick chance to introduce himself here, and then we'll we'll get rolling. Cool. I'm Ty Backer, like you said, owner and founder of TC Backer Construction and also co-host of Behind the Tool Belt, along with Chris Baker. That is a live stream, like you had mentioned, every Wednesday night, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Nice. Yeah. And I've been a guest on there and also I uh, watch it every week and, and love what you guys are doing on that show. I think it's fantastic. I think you guys always get some great guests on there and the topics are great and a lot of good information comes out of those, out of those weekly lives. Awesome job by you guys and great setup you guys have. Great execution there for sure. Thank you very much. I think the best thing that we have going for us is our consistency to, to go in at it week after week after week. And this week will actually be our 138th show consistently. We have not missed a week. It didn't matter if there was hail, sleet, snow, power outages, floods. We've done it where there's six inches of water in the studio come hell or high water. <laughs> we went live every single Wednesday night. I know, you know, having been in doing this podcast now for pretty much the better half of this year, I know how much of an undertaking that is to execute that. And we just release these every other week. So I can only imagine what you guys are doing to get those pump those out weekly. Very impressive. I know it takes a lot of work and a lot of time to to prep and execute those hats off to you guys for doing that. So thank you very much, man. Yeah, man. Thank you. It's great stuff. And I think it's what the industry needs. I think th those type of informational things and getting on podcasts like this, they're, they're just great ways for everybody to learn what everybody else is doing and be able to share information or, and to realize, yeah, we are in competition with each other, but at the same time, we can do a lot to help each other out. And there's some great people in this industry with some outstanding ideas. And I think that we don't leverage them enough. And I think things like this and behind the tool belt are really helping to do that. Some of the touring things that have we have going on right now in the industry that are really doing some fantastic things and spreading some fantastic messages, I think are great. Looking forward to being part of those and seeing everybody at the trade shows because those are great and things like this. You're just seeing better attendance on these podcasts, webinars and, and lives because they are great informational pieces for everybody. Heck yeah, I agree. I agree. And I don't look at you necessarily as competition as with another podcast or anything like that. If anything, you're, if you want to categorize it as competition, it would be more so the worthy rival. But honestly, I don't even look at it like that because I want to feed off of you in hopes that you can feed off of me as well. And uh, really, it's about putting out the information to our industry about what it is that we're doing, what's going on, and then bringing in really good guests. And what we do is we tend to start with what it was like and what it's like now and how you got here kind of thing and a little bit of their background and then plug, of course, what it is that they do to try to get out like a Hunter Blue or whatever he's trying to plug, RoofCon or Jen Silver and TJ McCormick and Tim Brown with them trying to plug one industry, one model and whoever, whatever, Roofers in Recovery, Paul Reed and Eric O, you know what I mean? So it's really just giving those people a platform to be able to scream from the rooftops, hey, we're here, this is what we're doing, these are the products that we're offering. And the more platforms that they can have to do that with, good for them, so they can get out what it is that they're trying to do to help our industry grow. And I think we're all traveling in the same direction as far as like, well, all we're really trying to do is just improve our industry, to try yeah. to get rid of that stigma that roofing has had for so long. It's no, it's, this is the new age of roofing. Like we're all about self-improvement, having an impact. What is our purpose? Things like that is what I feel like at least the people that we hang out with and those that come on our show, like you, Pete, like we, not that we 
vet those who come on or by no means would we ever do that. If somebody has a good product that they want to promote or just come on the show and they have a great backstory or whatever like that, by all means, come on our show. But I feel like at least our generation of roofing contractors or those of all of us that are in the industry in one way, shape or form are really only trying to have an impact in our industry, a positive impact, not a negative impact, but a positive impact in and on our industry today. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with you. I think that there's been a, a change, right? Honestly, I think in the last couple of years that I've seen to really change the whole view of this industry, the whole, like you said, the stigma, kind of the perception of the way the industry is. And I think that so much of that is just educating people. And like you said, there's a lot of guys out there that have some, that have built some incredible products that, or have some incredible messages that but it's just them being able to have a place to do it, right. To get the word out. And I think things like your show, this, this podcast, that those are their opportunities for sure. Heck yeah, man. I totally agree. And then the more of us that are doing podcasts, whether they be live or recorded, gives them that platform to be able to, to get what it is that they're trying to get across out there for those of us that, that need it. Those of us that own roofing companies. And I get so much out of listening to your podcast. Diego has a podcast that he's doing. John Dye. The list goes on. Tim Brown is doing his yeah. thing right now. I watch him on YouTube all the time. So I really don't feel like the podcast world has become like this, the battle of the podcast. No. I get so much out of listening to everybody's podcast. And honestly, I want to, I need to remain teachable. I have to not ever think that I've got this or I have arrived. All right. So Ty, I guess let's start by just tell me a little bit, tell me your backstory, right? Cause I think like you brought, you, you said you guys do that often on your show and I did that on your show. And I love to hear the stories of everybody in the industry and how they got to where they are. But I don't even know that I really know your story and i'd love to hear it like how did you get to the point that you're at today and what you guys are working towards okay that's a really great question and i don't normally get asked that question very often <laughs> because i'm the one asking the questions right <laughs> so first and foremost it's an honor and a pleasure to be on your show pete thank you so much for having me on your show a knucklehead like me so thank you very much so to go back and give you the sugar-coated version we'll need more time for me to actually go back to the beginning of my entire backstory. But I would whole say podcast, right? <laughs> yes, that would be we would need chapters. It would be episodes. Uh, seriously, it might be pretty cool to try something like that though sometime. <laughs> yeah. But uh, but the industry found me. I landed on my head and uh, I really honestly didn't have anywhere else to go. I had good work ethic. I was in a lot of trouble when I was a teenager and into my early to late 20s and I moved to York County. And I, I moved in with my sister and my brother-in-law and he had started a small roofing and siding business. And I worked for him for several years and it just got to the point where I felt like I outgrew the company where family just isn't always the easiest thing to work for. And God bless both of them because I wouldn't be where I am today without them. So I don't have an ill word to say about my sister or my brother-in-law. It's just really tough to work for family. Sure. He had dreams and goals and aspirations. And so did I, and they just didn't, they just didn't align. So I had left there sometime around 2006, 2008. I got my first LLC on July 17th, 2008, which was about 14 years ago. We just celebrated our 14th anniversary of TC backer construction. And it started out in a small apartment. I had a little garage out back. I lived on the second and third floor of this apartment building. It was actually my first home that I had ever bought back in 2005. And I rented out the first floor to, to try to help supplement the income and pay the mortgage and all that good stuff. It was my first home and the interest rates and all that stuff. I didn't quite understand any of that yet or whatever, <laughs> not to get off. I almost started to go off on it, out in the weeds on the interest rate thing there for a minute, <laughs> but I reared myself back in. But anyhow, it started out in my living room, right? So I worked every day, seven days a week. I would go out, I'd swing hammer. I'm a tradesman by trade. I love swing and hammer. I'm a first generation roofing contractor. Nothing was given to us. I, I knew I had to work. I had, like I said earlier, I had great work ethic. And uh, when I had left my brother-in-law, I took my best friend with me who had worked for me when I worked for my brother-in-law. And so we'd work seven days a week. We were subcontracting through subcontractors and stuff like that. That's why I say in 2008 is like when I went 
start. I had enough work of my own. I wasn't necessarily subbing through a sub. I was able to land contracts like Ryan Homes and Gemcraft and a couple other national and regional home builders. And I got tied in with an investor who flips about 300 homes a year. So we were doing their roofing, their siding, their windows, their gutters, and things like that. And that was right at 2008. So as everything else is like on the decline, this company that I had landed, this investment firm was on the rise. He had owned a car lot, a big Toyota car dealership. And he got out of that, sold that at the perfect time. So this dude had more money than the government, right? <laughs> So he went out and he was buying and flipping all these homes. And that's what carried us through 2008, 2009 and 10. I got involved with a bunch of real estate firms and things like that. So I had hired a guy to come in and work out of my living room because we didn't have an office, but I just knew if I continued to keep working the way that I was working 12 hours a day, another three, four, five, six hours at night, doing paperwork, estimates, quotes, all that crazy stuff that we do is young entrepreneurs that when we had the energy to do that shit friend came in his name's perry he actually still works for me today that's crazy <laughs> yes yep and keith actually just went on to uh, be a truck driver at uh, one of the companies that we work for keith the guy that i brought with me when i left my brother-in-law so retainage has been good for us but anyhow so that went on and then i met jan a lovely jan she quit her job she came to work for us. Our tenants on the first floor actually moved out. So the front room of that apartment downstairs, we turned into our office space. When I still rented out the back of it and Jana quit her job. She was an opt optometrist, I believe is how you say that for many years. And it was a big leap for both of us, for her to come work for us. And uh, things just kept growing and evolving. Like I, I surrounded, I, right away, I was able to surround myself around smarter people in certain areas that I wasn't so strong in. Perry was just a, just very tech savvy and Jana was very organized. I'm a roofer. I'm balls to the wall. I'm like, let's go, let's go. And both of them complimented me. Ty, just take a deep breath. We don't need to land another 1500 new homes from a home builder when it was just me. And like at that time, probably five guys, I'm like, no, we can do this. We can do this. We'll hire more people. And I've always been that way. Like, just get it and we'll figure it out later because I would much rather lay in bed trying to figure out how I'm going to get all of this work done than lay in bed and try to figure out how the hell am I going to pay my bills? How am I going to make payroll? So I've always had like that mentality of just get, just land the work and we'll figure it out later. <clears throat> so as time went on, we actually ended up moving back out to Dover where she was from. We actually moved into a house that she grew up in and it had a little barber shop. It was actually two lots. It was 37 and 39 North Main Street and it had 37 was a little barber shop, just like a 10 by 10 little rooms that, that I had remodeled and uh, Perry and Jana and I were, we have arrived. We made it to Dover PA again and we're in the hut. We called it the hut. And we started to recruit more people and it seemed like the more people we started to recruit, I would get concerned like, okay, now and take them on as my responsibility. So I looking back, I really feel like that's why we got to where we are today. Because anytime I would bring somebody on, like I'd get to know them, I'd get to know their family and now not just them, but their family's also my responsibility. So we needed more help. And uh, Miss Kim came to work for us. So she's been with us about nine years. She is our CFO. And again, I needed someone around me that was a lot smarter than I was, a lot more advanced than I was in those areas. Not that I don't know how to count money, but when you start dipping past the six figure and the seven figure mark, you need to start gathering the right people and have them on the seats, in the seats on the bus. We outgrew that quickly actually i tried to build a building out back the borough wouldn't let us do it because we were going to have it used as commercial use so we moved we found this beautiful building down the street from our house and that's where we are currently today we got to actually we ended up buying the building behind us so we have two six thousand square foot warehouses with office space that we're currently working out of now and to fast forward to today, we got 68 people that work for us currently in, in six different states. We have over 150 subcontractors on any given week 
that work for us. We do probably about 90 to 120 roofs a week, probably about 50 siding jobs, thousands of th upon thousands of miles of gutters on a weekly basis, and probably about 12,000 replacement windows a year. So we buy them direct from the manufacturer. So to rewind here a little bit, back in 2011, before we bought the building that we're in right now, the insurance laws changed and I love telling this story because this was probably one of my biggest or biggest fears of being an entrepreneur was that uh, we were required to have our people have workers comp. Okay. Cause back then, back in the day when I worked, technically I'm still unemployed on paper because I've always been paid a 1099. I've never had a real job where you'd get a W2. So back before 2011, everybody was paid 1099. Mm -hmm. And so 2011, Obama came in office, the insurance has all changed across the board and we were required. I remember, I don't know why I knew Obama was elected then, but it was 2011, Obama was in office and uh, we were required to put workers' comp insurance. And I was terrified because I know for me, I wanted that cash money. So I had to convince my guys, right, to, the, it's, you guys got to go on the books, man. I'll, I'll give you more <laughs> money. And then... The more research I started to do, what came along with a W-2 employee was workers' comp, not just workers' comp, but unemployment, okay? So when I got over that fear, I was like, you know what, That I felt some sort of sense of relief to be able to provide that. But God forbid I'd have to approach you and say, I don't have work today or I need to lay you off. And going back to where when I was saying that I bring these people in, that, that now they're my responsibility. So that made me feel good. So after I, I digested that and got over that fear and realized how cool that was, our second biggest goal was to provide health insurance. So that was one of my dreams. I heard, I just recently heard, and this is what's crazy about my dreams, that might be a little bit different than other entrepreneurs, but I think nowadays most entrepreneurs think the way that I do, but I recently heard this where my dream has to be big enough for everyone else's dream to fit in. So, like so, so thinking back, my dream was to be able to provide health insurance and at some point in time, not anytime soon, but to offer 401k. So several years went by and we were actually able to provide health insurance for our employees and we still do today. And then, like I said earlier, what one of my, probably my biggest dreams was, is how cool would it be if somebody could actually retire from TC Backer Construction? And uh, the only way that we could probably do that is to offer 401k. So about a year ago, when inflation got real high, we went ahead and gave everybody a dollar raise, all 68 people a dollar raise, right? Not because they were due for it, but because I wanted everybody to get on the 401k plan. 25 cents of that would cover the 6% inflation at the time. And then, oh, I'm sorry, 75 cents would cover the cost of the inflation. And then 25 cents, I negotiated with the bank to do where it would be $10 a week. So if you do 40 hours a week times 25 cents, that would be 10 bucks. So I wanted them to be able to have that 25 cents, nothing out of their pocket, plus another 75 cents to go in their pocket for them. And we did that about a year ago. And that now I got to come up with another dream because now I fulfilled all three dreams, right? Workers' yeah. comp, unemployment, health insurance, and now 401k. Now, of course, do have some ideas, but in case any of those guys or my coworkers hear what my next dream is, I don't want them to get too excited right away because this <laughs> next one's this next thing is going to be huge. It's basically the golden handcuff that I want to <laughs> offer, but a lot of them might not know what that is. But anyhow, hopefully I'm not taking up too much time. I, like I said, no one's actually really asked me that question before. No, nah, it's a great, it's a great story. I mean, it, it, I think it's one that I think is more common than people think in this industry where someone has started pretty much from nothing and built themselves up. I know like I worked for a contractor at my previous position. He was part owner of the company that I was at and he had done something very similar. He started roofing literally on the weekends as a teenager and uh, was able to build his company up to be very successful, has a bunch of people working for him now. And it's like on cruise control at this point because he's he's just surrounded himself with great people who have given him the ability to do that. But I think it's a, it's a great story. It proves that hard work can still get you where you want to go. 
And, and I think that it's fantastic that the things that you've been able to accomplish and the goals that you've set for yourself. And I love that concept of, hey, everybody else's dreams have to fit inside my dream. I think that's a great way of looking at it. Like you have to dream big enough that it's going to benefit everybody involved and not just maybe you or your family, your, the immediate people around you. Like it, when you're running a business, you got to be able to think big and be able to figure out how to get there. And so that's a, a great way of looking at it. I really, I really like that. Yeah. And I think I get that from my mom. My, both my mom and my dad are very caring and giving and was really huge into the community and having a huge impact on the community. And ever, my mom passed away, I think this year will be eight years and shit, January, I'm sorry, February 11th will be eight years this year. So when that happened to me, okay, that actually happened for me, by the way, I said happened to me. That actually happened for me because that kind of kicked me into a whole nother level, a whole nother gear of trying to have an impact on the community and those that are around me. I really, those were some big shoes that I had to fill after my mom had passed and the things that she instilled in me to work hard, give back what has been so freely given to us. We must give it away if we want to keep it kind of thing. And she lived by that, whether she knew it or not. And that's not how she put it, but that's how I interpreted it. That if I want to keep this thing, man, I got to give it away. And that's what everybody at TC Backer, it, that's one of our core values or whether it be somebody's personal core value, but my core value that we must give this thing away if we want to keep it. And whether they know it or not, that's what they're doing too. And that's what's cool about what we do at TC Backer today. And we just, we're involved with the community. We give back so much. We give free roofs, which I know is kind of cliche because it seems like everybody's doing that. But like literally we're giving away to help benefit and impact somebody's life. We feed the less fortunate on Thanksgiving, the day before Thanksgiving. We did a food drive. We did, we donated like, I think, shoot, like over 6,000 pounds of food to the local food bank two years in a row. And I think we're going to have to do it again before the end of the year so we can fill that back up because we were told it was only going to last to the end of August. But those are the things, those are like, I don't even want to call them my pet projects, but that's where I get my joy from. And what's cool about that is, is roofing, my most favorite thing, right, has been the vehicle to allow us to do those things. Like who would have thought that roofing, my job, my, my trade, my, uh, what I do for a living has been so phenomenal to me that we've been able to give back tenfold and have received immensely, not even trying that, that wasn't even our ulterior motive. It was just like, Hey man, these people need help over here. And I was in their shoes at one point in time in my life. And it's, it would, it, who am I to put my nose down to them or up to them, pardon me, and not reach out a hand to help these people is why I honestly believe that I'm put on this earth, that I understand that I'm on borrowed time today and I better take advantage of it. There's a reason why I was chosen to be here today. And I'm not by no means a Bible bumper or anything like that, but I, I do have a higher power. I choose to call him God today. And I see him work miracles in my life on a daily basis. And I just, I don't want to ignore that, nor do I want to take advantage of that or take it for granted. Yeah, I love that. And you touched on some stuff in your story there that I found very interesting. And I think that it parlays into what ultimately I wanted to talk to you about today, which is being the leader that you've become at TC Backer and in the community, like even far beyond just just beyond the everyday business. But I think that you really portray that as good as anyone. And I really respect you for it. Just in the short time that I've known you and I knew of TC Backer, even before I met you, the reputation preceded itself before you and I even met, whatever that was last year, I guess at IRE is when we mm -hmm. met for the first time. And I was very familiar with your company even beforehand. But, and I think a lot of, and that speaks a lot to the reputation of the company and how well you guys do and how positive you guys are for the industry and for the community and things like that. And, uh, but you touched on the fact that even early on, when you were really just getting going and you were working out of your living room, figuring out right away that you didn't know it all and being able to surround yourself with people that were smarter than you in certain areas, the areas that you felt like you had weak spots in. And I think so many times, especially for like young entrepreneurs, they try to do too much and they try to think they know too much potentially and take on too much. And they put themselves in a bad position because they literally go the opposite route. They try to run the whole thing themselves, which spread, spreads them way too thin and gives them this issue of then how trying to figure out this balance. And so speak a little bit to, I guess, you know, 
how you determine that early on to make that decision, because I think it is a decision that so commonly gets overlooked in any type of business that people start, not just roofing, just I'll just do it myself. I can handle all of this. And I think the fact that you recognize that so early and were able to go that route, I think speaks a lot to how you were able to build such a, such a successful team from the very beginning. Yeah. Yeah, shoot, don't get me wrong. There was a lot of ego and pride that that a lot <laughs> sure. of days that that got in the way. And you don't don't get that twisted. But I just knew what I was good at. And I was good at swinging hammers and chucking and jiving. You, you could go out there and our work, the work that we did, like you said, preceded itself. We were able to get a lot of referrals and we grew right from my own blood, sweat and tears. We grew. I slung a lot of siding and I slung a lot of shingles, man, and busted butt. And uh, that, I think a lot of people saw my work ethic and the positivity and we were fortunate enough to to attract people. But I also knew that I didn't like sitting in the office. There was a lot of things like I wasn't familiar with Excel. Perry was very good at Excel. I think QuickBooks came out. They may have been out, but Peachtree back in the day was like, like the QuickBooks, right? Yeah. So we ended up going with QuickBooks and Perry quickly figured out how to use QuickBooks. And I knew enough to be dangerous. And again, at this time, I'm still out in the field in the production end of things. Like I, I grew up in the production end of things. I enjoyed swinging hammer, doing takeoffs, meeting customers, doing sales, things like that. So right away, I gravitated to that. Even though I was able at times to start taking my tool pouch off, I knew things had to be happening when I wasn't in the office and things that quite frankly, I didn't want to do, nor was I very good at. So I think a lot of that was really probably just poor shit luck that I was able to <laughs> identify. I don't want to work another six hours after the 12 hours I was out in the field. So Perry came in three days a week there for a while, like I said, in my living room. And we had a little end table that had a filing cabinet that with just a couple files in it. Now today it's, it's grown significantly since then. And we laugh about that sometimes. So when we yeah, and it was like, yeah, man, I do remember that. And I will never forget that. And that's the thing too. It's, I don't ever forget where I come from, bum. And remaining humble was probably huge. And having humility and empathy ha has played a huge role. I think empathy, when we would bring somebody on and I would look at them and I would see their wife and they have a kid on the way or whatever. And I still feel that way. Like today, the difference between then and today is people actually feel comfortable enough to have families working at TC Backer. And that's so crazy. I got two girls in our office, two admins in our office, both of which are pregnant. And I look at them and, and I think some people are, oh my God, they're going to have to get off for two weeks. No way, dude. That's let we, We'll fill their shoes somehow, some way that'll work out. But more so than anything, it makes my heart happy knowing that they felt comfortable enough to have a family while working for TC Backer. I, I thought someone buying a new car and rolling up in it was cool <laughs> or a motorcycle these freaking knuckleheads trust me to the point where now they're busting out <laughs> babies and creating families man oh my god oh, that's do hilarious. you know what you just did to me now we got to go land 30 million more thousand dollars worth of work just to support these kids and their families that's great that's great right, but hopefully i answered your question oh absolutely and i, I find it very interesting i find this a very interesting topic i i'm a a baseball coach, a competitive baseball coach, and I have been for years. And so coaching, I related a lot to like work for the workforce and how when I coach these younger kids, middle school, the high school age kids, and you're developing them to really be productive citizens as much as you are developing to be players. And it's, and so I look at these guys and it begs the question to me, like we had a very interesting team this year and the question really hit me are you really born to be a leader or can you really develop yourself to be one? And did you see yourself as a leader early on? Did you, when you were thinking about the idea of, Hey, I've got these dreams that I've got these things I want to accomplish. I potentially want to own my own business. Did you see yourself as someone that you thought was going to have people working for you and have a big staff and a larger business? Or did you not, did that thought never even cross your mind early on? Did you ever like growing up even, did you see yourself as a leader or a potential person that could lead one day? Or is it something that you think just developed over time? That That's a really great question because what I thought 
a leader was back then is definitely not what I think or feel a leader is today. Okay. My perception back then of yes. So to answer your question, I guess first is that yes, I, I looked at myself as a leader, whether I was popular in school or the captain of the baseball team or whatever like that. So I had always had leader qualities. You know what I mean? I was the first one there, the last one to leave. I was playing ball when nobody else was playing ball. Like I'd play ball all summer long, whether banging a, a tennis ball against the, the post office brick wall, right? Like I was digging grounders. That's, I always had those leader qualities, but I think the part that I was missing was, is I guess I looked at myself look, reading a relentless. I was probably back in those days, more of a Michael Jordan, either you come to my level or you get the fuck off the dime. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. nowadays I try to land somewhere in between Simon Sinek and Tom Grove. You know what I mean? And, and for me, that works. If I can try to find somewhere in between, you know, holding people accountable without making them feel like a piece of crap or belittling <laughs> them. And like Gary V says with kind candor, kill them with kind candor. And that's so, this is where honing your craft to be a good leader. So you can be born with empathy. You can be born with an open heart or yeah, yeah, a huge heart, caring heart, and all of these other qualities, some of the qualities that, that fit into being a good leader, or you can run it with an iron fist, but two things happen when you run it with empathy and open heart and you're caring and you want to keep him, what happens and you get walked on and you get taken advantage of, right? At least from my experience. Okay. Yeah. And then on the other side of the spectrum, right? If you run it with an iron fist, my way or the highway, almost like a dictatorship. Yeah. Nobody wants to be around you. And I've been on both ends of the spectrums. I've been way too good and have been way, like taken advantage of and abused. And I think that was over the years, me trying to find that happy medium, because sure. when I was younger, I was a hard driver. And the culture that I grew up in was, is that you got your ass beat on the job site. If you did shit for half the time for not even doing anything, you just did because you were there, right? <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. just what, that's what I grew up in. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so when I was put in leadership positions, like when I worked for my brother-in-law, it wasn't about trying to find the solution. It was about whose fault is it? Right. Why is it? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, why is it, <laughs> right? Like, why isn't yeah. this done yet? And then get them in trouble and kick their ass and fire them. But today it's okay. If I come onto a job site, it's not who did it. It's more so, do you guys have the right equipment? Was the wind blowing? Like I'm trying to find a solution yeah. to try to streamline things. So over the years of trying to hone that craft, like I was too friendly when I would show up. So I went from one extreme to the next. Got my ass kicked being too friendly, taking advantage of buying all this stuff, trying to accommodate people, and then they don't even show up the next day. Like, I just bought yeah. you a new truck with a brake and pump jacks, bro, with an air compressor and <laughs> nail guns and a hose. What the hell? Yeah. Like, where'd you go? Oh, I should have been an asshole. But it put the fear of God in you to get to there's, there's this, yes, you can be born with the natural ingredients that I think should come natural for most people. But until you actually get your feet wet and start dealing with different personality traits, different egos, different cultures, because you can't treat everybody the same. You yeah. got to learn how to read people right away. Find out what their goals are in life. What do you want to accomplish? What would you like to accomplish? I want to make six figures. Okay, we'll put you in sales. Have you ever done sales before? What makes people tick? Where did they come from? What kind of upbringing did they have? Really listen to them and care. So then which buttons to push to motivate them, right? In a positive yeah. way, to impact them in, in a positive light. And that's not always easy. And some people just aren't easy to read either until... After a while, it's, some people do well with raises. Other people, it doesn't really matter. And this is the hardest part, I think. If you're in business long enough, okay, so there's this thing that's called recruiting and retaining. I call it re-recruiting, right? Like yeah. you have to re-recruit your people. And it's once you do one thing, then you got to think about how you're going to one-up that one and then one-up that one. Like when someone's worked for you for literally 9, 12, 14 years, like – you have to get super creative because yes, money motivates people. But what I've learned, it's not about the money. It's about how they're being treated and everybody. So this is the cool thing about the position that we're in today. I don't have to make all the decisions anymore. 
Like yeah. how cool is that? When you leave that up to your team, like when you have, we call it the business meeting. We hold it every Tuesday at 730. We go around the room. I don't want to just hear the problem. I also want to know the solution. Like, okay, we've experienced this, but this is what we've done to correct it. This is what we've experienced. This is what we, and we just go around the room to all of our principals throughout the company. And they know that they have a say in what happens. It's always taken in consideration. Either we use their idea or we use it, but we have to make a tweak to it. It's not that we will shoot it down, but then it's off of, it's almost like a vote. The, a census. What does the census think if we start doing this? Should we go work in West Virginia? How far is it from logistic wise from our shop? It's 45 minutes. Shit. Baltimore's an hour during seven o'clock AM traffic in the morning. So why not all of yeah. these decisions on a daily basis? I don't have to make them anymore. Can I influence them? Can I encourage them? Can I bring them to the table? Of course, that's what I do, but I want everyone to participate in the decision making and they need, and that allows them to know how important their job is because as good as they are at their job it's because of them being so good at their job their fellow coworker has a job and if they're slacking in an area and they're not doing their job so well then it pulls them away from their job because they're worried about you not doing the job. And then in turn, they can't do their job. So before there becomes an issue like that, we try to talk it out. Hey, I'm falling behind. Does anybody have time to help me get caught up? So we have an open dialogue of transparency where you're not going to get in trouble if you fall behind, but we're going to get someone's going to get upset with you if you fall behind and not tell us. And then it starts affecting us. No, I like that. And I think one of the comments you made earlier was very interesting. And then when you said, not only do you get to know the employee, but you get to know the employee's family. And I think that goes such a long way, right? Because like you said, every person's different and what motivates them is different. Like you always ask, what's your why? What's the why in this? And why are you here? Like, why do you want to work? What do you want to accomplish? And why do you want to accomplish that? Like everybody could say, yeah, I want to make six figures. Why? What's the reason behind it ultimately? And that's truly why you're there. And I think getting to know not only that person, but that person's family can really shed a lot of light on that and the type of person that they are and what they're looking to accomplish. And so it's a very interesting, a very interesting piece. I thought that was interesting that you threw that out there that you, and you also feel as a being the guy, the leader there, you feel responsible for everybody that you take in and their entire family, because they are in a way, even if it is indirectly, they are depending on you in some former fashion, getting to know them and how, what you guys are doing on a daily basis is affecting them is a big piece of it. Heck yes. Yeah, absolutely. Like yeah, absolutely. And this is the thing we have core values. We hire upon them and we fire upon them. And, and that's what helps create our culture. And we've let people go already simply not because that they weren't performing well, but they just didn't fit the culture. You, yeah. you know what I mean? And how absolutely. we've, how we've been able to do that in the least to let them down softly without a crash. We literally, this is what we do. We give people two week notices That's instead a, of just okay. showing up. Yeah. Like I give them a two week notice, man. Hey, look, I'm sorry. It's just your, look, if you want a great referral, by all means, you have your neck, have them call me and I will say nothing. But unfortunately, you just, you don't fit the culture and they probably know it. You know what I mean? They I think so. They, yeah. they feel it because all it takes, it's like cancer. It just takes one bad person. You know what I mean? That will crush and just ruin the culture. Our team has been through a lot, right? Like we've gone through the recession. We've gone through COVID. We're going through this, what we're going through right now. We can't be distracted. We call and going back to what Simon Sinek talks about it. It's called the circle of safety, right? Like we're the, what's that movie? Uh, three, not three, 300. What yeah. was that? <laughs> you, you, you know what I mean? Yeah. We're the, not the gladiators, but we're the Spartans. <laughs> yeah. We're the Spartans, yeah. man. Like we're, we're small, but we're mighty, but it takes all of us. Yeah. You know what I mean? It takes all of us with our shields up. And once that shield comes down, then something can penetrate, right? Yeah. So we're tight knit. We're family. I got, I couldn't, ex I, the only word that I could possibly come up with is family. If there was a word that was deeper than family, I would probably use it. But at TC Backer, where our culture is about family, helping each other out, 
having an impact on ourselves. First and foremost, it's our people over profit all day, every day. And a lot of companies say, oh, the customer comes first. Not at TC Backer. We take care of our people and then it's our customer. Because what I found that that helps us be able to perform at such a high level is that everybody feels safe. They don't feel like they're going to get in trouble if they make a mistake. And when you don't feel like you're going to make a mistake, you're going to feel a lot comfortable with the client. Let's say our salespeople, they feel more confident and to give them our company story, they wear that with pride. That's a badge of honor. It's like a Superman logo that's on their <laughs> chest. When, yeah. when you see the TC backer logo, like they wear that shit with pride, bro. When they yeah. roll up in the confidence that they have because of the circle of safety, it's giving me goosebumps right now because our shit runs deep, bro. Like our, it's almost like it's cult. And the fact that you guys have been able to maintain that as you've grown, I think speaks incredibly to what you've been able to do there and just the team that you've been able to build around you. Because I think that's one thing that a lot of times when companies are small, they're able to maintain that. And as they grow and expand and scale up and start to take on a lot of business, I think that's a piece of, that gets lost a lot of times. I think it's an easy piece to cut out, right? It's, a, it's an easy piece to stop doing and stop concentrating on because of the money and then the other stuff, the schedule and all that becomes more important. The fact that you guys have kept that first and foremost and been able to maintain that over the years speaks volumes to what you guys are doing there. I think that obviously you've honed your craft to where I think you're a tremendous leader. I think you guys have an incredible company going there. What would you say you've done some of the more impactful things that have helped you to really hone your craft as a leader, what maybe events you've attended or books you've read or whatever the case may be that you feel have really helped you to get where you're at right now. That's another great question. Okay. So event wise. So I would say my first eye opener to, to a lot of things was that has helped me go to another level was actually a win the storm conference. About seven, eight years ago, Jana and I flew out to, man, I think it was in Las Vegas, maybe somewhere. I don't know if it's Texas, Las Vegas, Louisiana, something somewhere. But anyhow, that was a huge eye opener to me, listening to the people on stage and then finding podcasts and listening to podcasts and then start reading. So I've let, I've read, I don't know how many books and a lot of them I reread. So Simon Sinek has played a big, huge part in probably my, my, uh, I guess I'm going to call it a spiritual journey, right? Because yep. let's face it, it's spiritual. It's one, me getting in tune with myself and finding how I tick and taking care of myself because I'm a firm believer. If I'm not taking care of myself, I can't take care of anyone else. And if, if I say I am, then I'm just being the martyr. So the selfish thing about this is I have to take care of myself. It's almost like being on an airplane where they say when the oxygen drops down, make sure you put yours <laughs> on first Yeah, <laughs> and then put your, put your co-pilot or your rider or whatever, your partner, <laughs> put your partners on, on, on second. So I have to take care of myself, whether it be eating, exercising and reading and doing some other things that, that, that helped me. I meditate. I do a daily devotions every single morning. I've been doing it probably for the past 12 years and it's really helped me stay centered, stay focused in my perfect note, but I know what I have to do to get back to that spiritual place. So I know intuitively know how to handle situations that used to baffle me, but books, I'd say Hunter Blue at RoofCon has probably been one of the most impactful most recently in my life. And I'm not just saying that because I'm a member of Revolt, but I loved, we take this year, we're taking about 16 of us down there. That's how much I believe in what Hunter's doing and his, his core values align a lot with mine. And he's readily available for me at any given time. If I come across something or whatever, not that I've necessarily have used him for things, but out of anybody, I think maybe it comes down to has had the balls to actually call me out on shit. Not that people don't call <laughs> me out on my, but the things most recently that he's called me out on, like we were at in Punakana several months back and he was busting my balls about not marrying Jenna and I have been together for about 12 years. And <laughs> dude, he was riding my ass so bad. Guess what we did? We got married in Punakana. I remember right? that. And let yeah. me tell you why. Let me tell you why. Like I'm real big on legacy and having an impact. There was this 
huge component of legacy that just went totally over my head. My family. Right? If I die today, people are in three years from now, people are going to probably forget about Jana. Right? Like, I have this tribe behind me that are my biggest cheerleaders, but none of them have my last. So if I would pass away, and that's what I started thinking about. He didn't say that to me, but for whatever reason, about the third day there, man, of him just, <laughs> now everybody's doing it behind Jana's back. Nobody does it at this point in time. Dude, I got like a fucking headache. Like, I don't even want to get out of bed. I feel sick. Like, I'm a piece of shit. I'm wasting Jana's time. All of these years, like all of these things are going through my head, but he stayed on me. And, uh, but that's what it is. It's okay. Jan has got my last name now. Now I got my own tribe. Yes. Yeah, so I got a brother, sister, my dad's still alive and I got some nephews and nieces, but some of them will carry on the backer legacy. But for us, our son rocket and Jana, how fair was that for her to not continue that legacy? Perhaps after I'm gone with the backer, crest and feeling confident and, and able to do that, if that makes any sense. But I just felt like some of yeah. that just went over my head, that, that part of legacy that I just, that crucial, probably the biggest part, my family, yeah. like, <laughs> cheapers, cruiser, like, again, I'm still trying to figure shit out. I'm still learning. The second <laughs> that I feel like I got this thing figured out, dude, I'm in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think that's a great point. I think that you always have to stay humble enough to learn. There's, you learn stuff every day. Like I learn stuff every day. I, like I said, I always equate things back to coaching and I've been coaching now, geez, I think almost 20 years. And I still learn stuff from other coaches every time I go out with them and just their approach or their technique, or just even sometimes it's just little things that they do. And, uh, and even like, I'm one of the roofer is a great company and we're just, we have some great people, but we're very young, a lot of young people. And I'm one of the older folks there, one of the more seasoned guys, but it's amazing. Like, I can learn so much from these younger people and I, I love working with them and they just have a great outlook on things. And it's really helped me a lot. I definitely learn a lot from them and being around them. I think that's a huge piece to keep in mind, especially from a leader standpoint, right? Just because you're the leader doesn't mean you can't learn stuff. And sometimes from the people that are working under you, a lot, a lot of times from them, they'll open your eyes to some great stuff. So I think that's a very important point. Amen. And they'll respect you a lot more when you're not walking around acting like for everything. If you can yeah. humble yourself <laughs> enough to give them the credit. And that's the, that's another good, great point is to one of the great, one of the qualities of, of being a great leader is accepting and admitting and owning when you're wrong and giving credit to, oh my God, that's such a great idea. I've never thought of that. You know what I mean? And that's where that collaborative thinking comes into play. Because honestly, dude, I don't want to make all the decisions today. I don't want all my <laughs> answers to be the right answers today. Like yeah. I'm done fighting myself. I spent probably yeah. half of my career, like, like still fighting myself. And, yeah. and, but now it's our job as leaders is to, is to train or show people not what to think, but how to think, or you're never going to be able to grow. If yeah. you want to have a seven, eight, nine figure business, there's not enough hours in the day for one human being to do that. Like you got to delegate and create jobs. And, and cause I, early on in my business, I did 15, I wore 15 different hats and that created probably five full-time jobs. Yeah, when I st started to give away some of these things, it was like, oh my God, <laughs> like I was the bottleneck. What? Right. I, me? Because n nobody's going to do this as good as I do it. But this is the thing. Once I realized if I could find somebody that can do it 70% as, as well as the way that I thought that I could do it, they're doing it a hundred times better than the way I'm doing it now, because <laughs> now I'm just mediocre at it. Right. No, that's great. Yeah, that's a great way to look at it. And I do think it's one of the most common mistakes, right? Because you just, you operate under the assumption that nobody's going to do it the way I do it. And I think part of that is being a business owner. And obviously you take a lot of pride in your own business when you have one. And so you don't want there to be mistakes and you don't want to see it fail. So you just think, I'll just do it myself because <laughs> at least I know the way I want it to run. And I think recognizing that other people can step in and do it as well, if, or like you said, if not better, yeah. is a big part of being a leader and being able to admit that and take that step back and let someone else take control of a piece of your business. I think it's a tough thing to do, and but I think it, it definitely represents a big quality of being a good leader is being able to relinquish that control a little bit and that responsibility. For sure, man. For sure. There's definitely people that work for us 
that that are way smarter and have done things way better, more efficient, whether due due to technology or whatever the case might be, things are different today. But there's jobs that I wouldn't want to do, nor could I probably do that people do for us today on a daily basis. And you made up a good point about people making mistakes. What's crazy about this is we need them. To, it's almost like we need them to make mistakes. Yeah. And I know that sounds like, what do you mean? Unfortunately, that's the only way that I've learned was right. through my mistakes. And people don't, how does this saying go? It's like people don't learn things by you telling them things. They catch things by watching. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like they catch things, right? So like they, they got to make the mistakes. And of course, it's never a good idea to you think, or they think it's a good idea to do it a certain way or whatever, but you just cross your fingers and hope that it's not a very expensive mistake. Cause I've made mistakes. I've made very expensive mistakes, but sure. they got to make mistakes in order for them to grow and be good leaders. Because as the, the position that I'm in today, right? My, my position is to develop and groom the next generation of leaders. And at this point in time, I'm really just everybody's biggest fan, biggest cheerleader, like rooting them on, keeping them motivated, re-recruiting them. I'm not out in the field swinging a hammer today. I do enjoy going out and selling a job. So I still do that, especially if it's like a referral from somebody that I did a long time ago and they're asking right. specifically for me. I have no problem going out there because some people don't want to deal with a stranger. They know me, our name. It's, oh man, sure. Ty Backer was here. And I'll do things like that. But today I just need to make sure that they have the tools to perform at the high level that I know that they can perform at. Whether it be two or three or four monitors that help them be more efficient or printers. And really it's much more than that. Like we do continuous education too. That was one of my goals too. So we have people going to school that work for us. I pay them to go to school plus pay for their school. Sam, who works under Kim, or probably nowadays they're more equal, and hopefully she doesn't hear that, that Sam works for Kim. <laughs> but, but she's going to school for business management and accounting, plus works for me full time. Nice. You know what I mean? So we do what's called yeah. a payback tuition plan, and uh, he's killing it. You know what I mean? Like she loves numbers and she was already going to school prior to working for us, but it was for something else. But after about 12 months of working here, she approached me and was like, Hey, I really like my job. And I was like, would, would you want to go to school to become an accountant? And she was like, that would be great. And I was like, how about if you could go to school and you get paid to go to school? And she was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> you, you know what I mean? But it's only yeah. really realistically, it's going to benefit her. That's her dream fitting. Inside my dreams, <laughs> my dreams got to be big enough yeah. for all of their dreams to fit in that. And that's these crazy, that's re-recruiting your people. The yeah. hard part, when you've done this for so long, the hard, how the fuck am I going to top that one now with Sam? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, granted, other than pay for her pregnancy, maybe, because she's one <laughs> of the ones that are pregnant now, but, but she will be internally grateful for TC backer yeah. and her coworkers who've made this possible. Me, all I did was, is I had a good enough story to sell them to come work for us <laughs> and stay here and work for us. You know what I mean? But it was everyone yeah. else that's done the work that's got us where we're at. They're the face of the company. now. Yeah. And it's great. a cool place to be in, man. Yeah. For sure, mm -hmm. for sure. And her dreams will change now, right? Like you said, she's starting a family and stuff, so her dreams will change, which will give you some other stuff to work with. <laughs> right. More will be revealed, my man. I'll let you know how we make out with that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. Man, I really appreciate you coming on. I think that, I guess my only last question would be like, where do you guys go? Where do you go from here? Like, I think you guys have done some amazing things and you personally, I think have accomplished a tremendous amount of stuff in your time. And what do you have left dream wise? Like for yourself as a leader for the company, what are some things that are still on your mind that you want to accomplish? I think most people in my position are probably looking for an exit strategy, but I'm hoping that I can actually help my business biggest goal and dream right now is to maybe help other roofing contractors with their exit strategy. And what I mean by that is, is maybe buying up some other roofing companies. I'd like to move down into the Carolinas, Georgia, Florida, nice. Louisiana, over to Texas. And if there's anything that I could do to help facilitate that, even if they came work for us, but we implement our systems and processes and things like that, that's our next big goal. Because I want I thought we want to move down into Virginia Beach, our next location. And it's how can we do that 
quick, fast, and in a hurry. And I don't know if somebody had mentioned like, why don't you look to see if there's other roofing contractors down there that might be willing or ready to someone like me that's been doing it for 14, 15 or five years or whatever. That, that are that's just ready to get out they're done they've fulfilled themselves with whatever dreams and aspirations that they had and maybe we can help facilitate their exit strategy for them and purchase their company under a sales agreement or whatever makes sense for them to ride it out or maybe they're just done and they're like here take it please <laughs> i'm done which yeah. i can get i get that sometimes but that's probably sure. one of my biggest things and maybe find more time to uh focus on traveling with Jen Silver and TJ McCormick, doing more things like that, getting up on stage and sharing some of my experience, strength and hope. Cause I, I enjoy public speaking a lot. Like, like today we're just rapping right now. I don't have a script. I just, we're sure. rapping and people yeah. ask me questions and I think usually I can respond to them pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No. And I think that's a, that's a great piece. I think it's a great piece that this industry needs, right? Like it needs people that have a great story that they can relate to that have become successful and have proven that you can do it with hard work and the right attitude. And I think that being able to share your story like this where other people can get access to it is great. It's a huge part of, I think, what's going to change the way that this industry functions and operates. And the people that are successful in the industry are the people who are going to be like you that are going to take your advice. And even if you, like I said, everybody, you listen to our podcast and you go listen to behind the tool belt. And even if you take one little piece, like what, even if we talk for an hour today and there's one gem in there that somebody grabs, then it was worth it. It was worth Absolutely. listening to this podcast. And, and if you listen to enough of them, you're going to pick up a lot of great stuff. And I appreciate you being on here today, sharing your story and sharing what you guys have gone through and what you've accomplished because it's great. I think you guys have a tremendous business over there and I look forward to keeping an eye on TC Backer and seeing what you guys do over the next couple of years and, and seeing you. I think you and I have got to know each other a little bit and I appreciate that. And I, I was glad I got to meet you finally. Like I said, you're, I knew your business long before I knew you and uh, getting to meet you at IRE and getting to share some time with you there was great. And I really appreciate you, you jumping on with me today and having taken some time to talk. Yeah, man. I appreciate you having me on, man. It was a pleasure. And you're the first one that heard the sugar coated. I could, again, we could do about eight episodes <laughs> to like actually pull everything from beginning to end out of it. Sure, I'm sure. <laughs> but thank you for, and this is good practice for me too. try to just keep it simple and maybe I can rewatch this and pull some nuggets out of it to condense my story a little bit better and maybe add some fill in the blanks a little bit and uh, make it a little better for someone's experience to listen to. No, absolutely. I think it's great information and great insight. And I think that anyone listening, there's definitely some gems in there. If you, especially, I always think of it like if I was a new roofer, if I was new to the business or new to the industry, and I was listening to this to try to gain some insight, is there things in there that I could learn from? And I think that some of the information that you shared today would be just invaluable to them starting out and looking to build a business. So that's great. And I appreciate you sharing all that stuff. Thank you, brother. Thank you for having me. And I appreciate it. And be sure to check us out next time on the Roofer Report. Great guests like Ty Backer and, and great topics. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks, everybody.